Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's NAC Talk. You're in for a real treat. This is going to be a fascinating and uplifting reminder of nature's incredible adaptability. I'm Judy Gradwall, President and CEO of the San Diego Natural History Museum, and our building in Balboa Park is closed for the next several months. But our staff and volunteers are working harder than ever to fulfill our mission of interpreting the natural world through research, conservation, and education. Last week alone, we uh, had a number of, of interesting developments. We worked toward improving the building's sustainability. We developed virtual learning opportunities for students, and we surveyed the Coachella Valley's riparian habitat for rare birds. Our volunteer canyoneers released a list of 10 best hikes for fall, and you can find this roundup on the Nats blog. Our membership department implemented a brand new online series of member meetups. At these interactive Q&As, you'll meet museum staff and get a view of the work that goes on behind the scenes. The first of these meetups takes place on September 25th, so if you're not yet a museum member, now is a great time to join. Our next Nat Talk is Understanding Bird Behavior with Wen Fai Tong on Wednesday, September 30th. Of course, none of these activities could take place without your support. The tickets you purchased tonight, your donations, and your Facebook shares all help our mission thrive during this time, and we thank you greatly. Now on to tonight's talk. The 2019-2020 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor the Downing Family Foundation and media partner KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial Counties. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Ken Catania. Ken is a biologist and neuroscience teaching and conducting research, new, teaching and conducting research at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And he is dealing with the time change too. So we thank him for putting up with uh, California time. He studies animal sensory systems, brain organization and behavior in diverse species, several of which you'll hear about tonight. His studies often focus on predators that have evolved special senses and weapons to find and overcome elusive prey. And he is considered an expert in extreme animal behaviors. He studies specialized species because they can reveal general principles about brain organization and sensory systems. But he also believes that there is unappreciated beauty and elegance in the behaviors and diverse forms of these extraordinary animals. Catania was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2006 and in 2013 received the Prada Research Award in Neurosciences from the National Academy of Sciences. In addition to his scientific publications, his work has been featured in magazines such as Scientific American, Natural History Magazine, and The Scientist. His discovery of a mechanism similar to a taser in an electric eel by absorbing the shock through his fingertips was widely covered in the popular press. And of course, we're gonna to hear tonight about his book that is hot off the presses, was just, uh, just uh, released yesterday. So welcome, Ken. Thank you, Judy, for that introduction. And thanks, Emma, for putting things together here tonight. And I'm really excited to be here and actually a little nostalgic because I was actually in grad school in San Diego. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about was kicked off with research at UCSD when I was a graduate student. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about sort of an exploration of unusual species and some of their amazing adaptations. And uh, this is coming out or just came out in, the, in, in my new book, Great Adaptations. And a lot of people, I think, in biology might start this kind of a talk by telling you something about what it means about ourselves, what it means about humans to study strange animals. So I'm going to give sort of a, a very well-known example that's known to pretty much everybody in the neurosciences. And so people have, have, were studying squid and their escape responses, and they discovered this gigantic nerve fiber called the giant axon of the, the squid. And it's huge because big neurons, this is the nerve cell, carry information much more quickly than smaller ones. And this is the axon that mediates escape responses in the squid. And it turned out because it was huge, 
it was something that people could experiment on. Hodgkin and Huxley famously determined how neurons communicate signals in pretty much all animals and got the Nobel Prize for this work uh, based on studying this unusual part of this interesting animal. And um, so that's one way of sort of looking at interesting animal adaptations. Um, but tonight, and, and also in, in my book, I'm sort of looking at this in what I think of a different way, a much more exploratory sort of view of animals and their adaptations. And so I wanted to use the Hubble Space Telescope as a metaphor for the way that I want to think about these things tonight. And so this is an instrument, of course, where what we do very often is to just peer out into our surroundings and discover amazing things about the way the universe is put together. And sometimes what you might look at using the, the telescope would be sort of an outlier out there in our, in, in our surroundings. And, and this is one of those famous images of the Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation, which are clouds of hydrogen gas that are where new stars are being formed. And it, it sort of typifies the beauty and the astonishing things out there, along with things we can learn about what's going on in the universe. So that's one way to look at these things. Another way to look at, at, at our surroundings is to look at maybe what you might think would be a normal bland area of, in this case, the universe again. And this is the famous ultra deep field image by Hubble that looked at a bland area of the night sky and discovered 10,000 galaxies in that little sliver, which totally revolutionized our view of the universe. And so that I think uh, sort, of, sort of tells you the rewards of simply taking a closer look at something and learning about what's going on. And so that's what I'm gonna do tonight in this talk. And I wanna tell you about taking a closer look, of course, on what's going on here. And when I was thinking about this talk, I, I, I realized that along the way of these studies that there were clues that I had encountered. And especially looking back, I realized when these clues occurred, where I had to notice something that would lead me sort of like the next breadcrumb in the scientific journey. And so what I decided to do tonight was put this little magnifying glass um, when one of those clues appeared during the research and sort of both to remind me and to sort of tell you that that's something that was going on. Okay, so with that analogy to astronomy, I guess it's appropriate that I'm going to tell you first about the star. So this is um, the enigma of the star. This is a star nose mole emerging from its tunnel. And it is something that has been a mystery to biologists since it was very first described. You know, what is going on with this nose? It's very unusual. What might it be for? How did it evolve? What does it do for the mole? So these were longstanding questions that were out there. And um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I first got interested in this. And I'm gonna go way back in the beginning for a moment and tell you that my first real classroom was the forests and streams where I grew up. And I was just completely obsessed with every animal that I could find. And my parents were really indulgent in letting me bring them home and keep them as pets and, and try to learn about them. And, and so that is uh, something that served me really well as I continued to go on studying different animals that I had a sort of feel for the, for the natural world from that, from that time. And I'll also mention another thing that sort of helped me along was my parents gave me this book called Animal Oddities. And there was a star nose mole in this book. And so I learned a little bit about this animal. And amazingly, here's the answer to one of those quiz questions. I found a dead star nose mole in the stream behind my parents' house, just basically sitting there among some rocks. And so I was absolutely astounded by that because I thought, wow, there's an animal from this book in my backyard, essentially. And um, that uh, led me to think about where might it have lived. So I learned a little bit more about it. I looked for more of them in the wetlands. I never actually found one, but I learned a lot about where they live. And I was intrigued with this animal. And so I'm going to fast forward now all the way to when I was an undergraduate at the University of Maryland. And I got a volunteer opportunity at the National Zoological Park in Washington. And this volunteer opportunity was, of all things, to study just one animal, to study the star-nosed mole. So the head curator there, Ed Gould, 
was curious, as many biologists have been, about what the heck the star is for. And he had this hypothesis that maybe, maybe this antenna-like nose was for detecting electric, electric fields, as a lot of fish can do, and some amphibians can do, and sharks can do. And so I began to start to do studies in the small mammal house, basically testing this idea about whether or not this might be possible in this, in this interesting animal. And um, the first thing, though, that was a big challenge in, in the studies was getting enough star-nosed moles because they're very hard to find. And so I was sort of sent on um, what I like to call a snipe hunt to uh, northern Pennsylvania to attempt to collect these guys. Um, and I, I say that because they are actually very hard to find. And so, um, but I thought maybe this was something that I could pull off. I, I liked the idea of the challenge. Um, so I went up there in a van with a couple hundred traps, a cooler full of hundreds of earthworms and a few bags of groceries. And I started to look around for what might be the right habitat in this general area. So I drove for hundreds of miles looking around and I eventually found some really wonderful wetland habitats. And this is prime star nose mole territory because they are semi-aquatic animals and yet they live in tunnels. So I have illustrated for you just to spur your imagination where these animals would live in this wetland. These aren't actual tunnels that were in this place, but there, there would be tunnels in those air, all over those areas. And uh, so that is, is the challenge. How do you find out what's living in that area? And so um, along the way, I also met a guy named Carmen who owned a cabin nearby. And this is a fellow, um, at first I was really worried about approaching the cabin because you know, your imagination about a, a, an isolated cabin in the woods uh, can sort of take you anywhere really. And yet the wetland was right next to this. And so I was worried about whether this was somebody who would uh, be upset that I was there or, or whatever else I could imagine might go on. But eventually I met the guy and he turned out to be a really wonderful person who basically, you know, he sort of said, you got to help out the young people. He saw that I was a struggling biology student on this mission. And he said, uh, so this was his fishing cabin. He said, you know, not only can you use the land, but next time you come up, you can just use my cabin as sort of a base of operations. And, and it turned into a long friendship. And it was just one of those wonderful chance meetings um, that has occurred a number of times in my life as I've sort of done various ecology work. Okay, so I wanted to, to, to mention this guy. Um, now, this is an example of the habitat where next to the cabin where these guys, the guys live. And each of these flags marks a place where I set out little traps to try to find out was, what was in these tunnels. So these are little Sherman folding traps that you put in the tunnels to see what's living down there. And this was an amazing experience in sort of what I call a crash course in mammal diversity. Because what would happen is you walk along and you check the traps and you just wonder, you know, what animal might have gone into them. And there's lots of different species. And so the first thing I started catching was meadow voles. And I did have to pose this question about why isn't the world made of, of meadow voles? Because they eat grass. This guy's surrounded by grass. They breed all year round and there's tons of them out there so 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 there's um you know not it doesn't seem like there's much holding them back but i'll come back to that um here's another species from the traps this is a short-tailed shrew this is one of the few mammals that actually has venomous saliva so you don't want to get bit by this guy it but it eats mostly insects and other invertebrates this is an amazing little animal. This is a masked shrew. It's one of the smallest mammals on the planet. Uh, they're super fast. They have very fast uh, reflexes and they weigh only about three grams. This is a hairy tail mole. They also live in that habitat and they live sort of on the fringes, fringes of the wetland. Uh, this, is a, this is a water shrew. These guys are shrews that dive down into the water. They can catch fish and crayfish, and they'll also eat insects. It's the smallest mammal diver in the world. And this is a short-tailed weasel. This is a beautiful animal. And 
this is one of the reasons that the world isn't made of voles because um, this actually here is the remnants of his dinner, which is a vole. So these guys get down into the tunnels and hunt these other little mammals. And of course, there's lots of other predators that, that'll, that'll go after these mammals like, like owls and hawks and snakes and so forth. And finally, I succeeded and managed to catch a starnose mole. So this was sort of a real um, victory in, in being able to bring some of these animals back to the zoo. So this is a sort of a face on view of one of the moles, but I also wanted to show you what these guys look like when they're going through a tunnel. So this is a more natural view when you can see the whole animal's body. These are the forelimbs used for digging and there's the nose that it's using to go around snuffling through its environment and exploring things. So I'm going to make a long story short when I talk about the electroreception question at the zoo because it was one of those experiences that is very common in science, which is this didn't work out. It didn't turn out to be true. The moles did not respond to electric fields. And so I'm just basically that turned out to be a dead end. But it wasn't all bad because I had these wonderful experiences. I learned a huge amount about these mammals and I also learned a huge amount about electroreception, this sense that various animals have to detect electric fields, which includes amphibians, electric fish, catfish, sharks, and other species. And I got so excited about this that I decided I wanted to go to graduate school to study electroreception in various aquatic species. And so I was very fortunate to get accepted to UCSD and I worked, I, my mentor, Glenn Northcutt, was is a wonderful uh, uh, neuroscientist who probably knows more about animal brains and their evolution than anyone else on the planet. And so he took me into the lab and we started looking together at electroreceptive anatomy in a lot of different species. And actually we were working in this building, this is a picture off the internet, but the actual building I was working in for a lot of this research is right there. And there was a microscope right in this region. I managed to find a picture of that model microscope. So among the very many things that I learned in graduate school was how to use this scanning electron microscope, which I like to call sort of for the microscopic universe. So I'm comparing it to Hubble here. I also say it's sort of the dream instrument if you sort of grew up on Star Trek and science fiction uh, because here you have this console full of knobs and dials and these sort of viewing screens that remind me of the enterprise deck. And you can put an image and uh, a specimen here. And basically it's kind of like you're looking at an alien landscape. So I got proficient on this microscope and eventually I thought, hmm, you know, this would be the perfect way to go back and look at that enigmatic star and try to learn more about it. So Glenn supported this idea to go and get some more starnose moles and see what was really going on with this structure and get a better view of it. And so uh, I went back with field trips to Pennsylvania, back to Carmen's cabin, and here is the star under the scanning electron microscope. And it is absolutely amazing structure. So there's 22 appendages. These are the nostrils here on either side. And each of these appendages is totally covered in little tiny domes. This whole thing is about the size of your fingertip. And these domes are little microscopic touch receptors called Eimer's organs. So there's 25,000 of these things that, they, that you could essentially say that the star is made of touch receptors. And this is really astounding. And it's astounding, especially when you, when you start to compare the star to the human hand. So we start to look at the anatomy of the star, how it's innervated, what's the structure of the receptors underneath each of these little swellings. And if you compare it to the human hand, the human hand has about 17,000 touch nerve fibers in it. And we definitely think of the human hand, rightly so, as sort of a triumph of evolution. It, it sort of underlies our ability to make tools, to use tools, to, to use computers, and, all, and, and to do all the things that um, we, we do with our, our sophisticated minds. 
And yet, if you look at this in comparison to a Starnose mole's nose, there's 100,000 touch nerve fibers in this structure. So more than five times the number of touch receptors in this little tiny structure that's the size of your fingertip. So absolutely phenomenal resolution. You could think of this as sort of a hyper-resolution pixels in, in a camera, except these pixels are for touch. Okay, so um, I wanted to show you a Starnos mole in action because um, seeing the, what these guys can do is really amazing. So this is what you're seeing the laser pointer point at is a little embossed X on an aluminum foil sheet. And this mole has been trained that underneath that X, there's a food reward. So there's no olfactory cues. They don't have eyes to, to speak of. And you can see how quickly it's moving through the tunnel there. And one single touch and that mole is able to immediately determine that's where it wants to be. It digs through, gets its food reward, and then it's gonna move through the rest of this maze where there's additional little uh, cues for it to find. So they're very fast, very efficient. And I, now I wanna go back to the star and tell you about the first clue that I found that there was something more amazing going on with star nose moles. And this was doing something that all of us scientists do, which is just making a careful record of what I was seeing under the scanning microscope. And when I did that, I realized that there's actually these borders here between the appendages where there are no Imer's organs. So each of these appendages is a separate unit. And here I really want to invoke Pasteur's famous quote that in, when you're making observations, chance favors the prepared mind. And so for me, that preparation was learning about something in brains in a class at the University of Maryland. So this is the human brain. And there is an area in the human brain right about here where touch information projects. And there's what you'd call a map of the human body right in this region in the way that the neurons respond. So this is sort of famously called the Penfield homunculus for a little human. So I'm sure many of you have probably seen this where the human body is laid out in a particular topographic way right through this part of the brain. Now, the thing that I had seen in school was uh, that there's another kind of map that has been really heavily studied, and this is found in rodents, especially rats and mice, where in this, they also have a map of the body in the same general location, but there's, very, there's something very special about their map. They're these little circular units that you can see in the brain tissue, and each one of these circles is actually the part of the map that represents a single whisker on the mouse face. So this is actually a visible brain map, and this is called cortical barrels. And there's whole books written about this area. There's a whole scientific meeting about this area because it has helped neuroscientists so much to understand the neocortex. And so I thought back to this and I wondered, wow, what if maybe the Starnos mole's brain has a visible map in it? And so I talked to this with, about this with Glenn Northcutt, and he said, we should talk to this guy, John Koss, at Vanderbilt University, because he's sort of the, one of the world's experts on these kinds of brain maps. So I went to Vanderbilt, and I, I, I talked to John, and we started collaborating on the Starnos mole brain. And sure enough, after a short amount of time, we discovered that there is a visible brain map in the Starnos mole's brain. Now, one of the things I should mention is that only half of the body projects to each half of the brain, and that's true in humans as well. So what you're seeing here is half of the star projected to this area in the anatomy of the, the, the mole's brain. So there's lots of interesting things to learn about the neocortex from this map, and I'm gonna enlarge it for you here. So this is half of the mole's star, and here's the half of the brain where that star projects. And one of the very first things that jumped out as sort of another breadcrumb in the mystery of Starnos moles was this area here. It's absolutely huge in the brain map. And the question is, why should it be so big? Because that area of the star is not all that big on the mole. So that was sort of the next question. 
And that required looking at Starnow's mole behavior much more closely. And that in turn required getting a high speed camera that could slow down the motion because as you may have noticed on that previous video, the moles are moving really fast. So this is gonna be a video of the star nose mole slowed down immensely. And I'm gonna show you something that's quite remarkable. And that is that star nose moles, it's gonna move over and touch this thing with the side of its star. And then it's gonna do something it does every time when it's interested in something, it moves over and it touches that again with the 11th appendages. And that, what the mole is doing when it does that is the same thing that you're doing while watching this talk. And that is we humans have a visual phobia and that is an area of high resolution vision. And so you are constantly moving your eyes back and forth to look at things in detail. And we are very used to doing this because that's where we analyze things with highest resolution. And so what I wanted to do is just to highlight this is, you know, if you looked at this letter of the cover of the book and kept your eyes still, you would not be able to read the rest of this cover. So you might think you're seeing a picture of this, this surface, but really you're only seeing that picture by moving your eyes. If you kept your eyes still, it would be much more like that. And the same thing is going on with star nose moles. Basically, it turns out what they're doing is constantly shifting their star to sort of see things with touch in a, in, a, in a metaphorical sense in high resolution with this area of the star. So that is really a sort of a, an amazing convergence of the way that their sensory system is designed, so to speak, designed by evolution, of course, um, in order to process things in detail. And it saves a lot of brain territory because you can bait and it does, and, and we save a lot of brain territory by doing the same thing with our visual uh, system that the Starnos mole does with touch. So that was another sort of step forward in understanding the star, but there was something else that was sort of uh, interesting about the way that I got to discovering this. And that was the fact that it required a high speed camera just to look at how the star was moving. And now what I want to do is show you a star nose mole searching for a bunch of little things in real time. So you can see just how very fast they are. So this is going to loop for you. It's absolutely phenomenal how quickly they can identify and eat these little things. What's happening here is in two and a quarter seconds, this animal is able to eat eight different things. And that requires identifying where they are, moving to the 11th appendage, that fovea appendage, deciding to eat them, and then moving to eat them. And this is so phenomenal that it actually put star nose moles into the Guinness Book of World Records as the fastest foragers among mammals. The shortest time that they can make these discriminations is about a tenth of a second. So they can do all of this, touch something, move to the fovea and eat something in less than the time it typically takes for you to move your eyes when you, when you see something new in your, in your visual field. So when you, when you move your gaze. Now that was a, a really kind of fun finding, um, but I was wondering, and here was another clue about star nose moles, why should they be so fast? So I was pondering this when I went to the Society for Neurosciences meeting in Washington, DC. And this is an absolutely huge meeting that has over 30,000 attendees, rows and rows of posters, people presenting research throughout the day and research talks. And this is just a tiny fraction of what you would see for this five day long meeting. And you might think I'm saying all this because I went to this meeting and discovered something amazing about star nose moles. Well, that's not what happened. Actually, what happened was I was completely overwhelmed and I needed a break. And I went uh, to DuPont Circle where there was a used bookstore just to sort of take a little time to, to have some quiet and think for a while. And while I was in that bookstore, I came across a book about foraging theory. And this is sort of one of the major works in the field that looks at how different predators make choices about what they're gonna eat 
based on the timing of how long it takes to eat things, how valuable things are when they eat them. It was as if this book was sort of written, certainly the first couple chapters for someone pondering what I was thinking about at the time. So it was a really a, a wonderful sort of chance discovery. And one of the things that it turns out is the, that to think about prey choices, prey are ranked by their profitability. How profitable is it, an, is it for an animal to eat one thing or another? And that is very simply the amount of energy gained divided by the time it takes for the animal to handle that thing, which is essentially what I showed you for star-nosed moles. Now, um, nobody really has seemed to ever really contemplate what would happen if this part of the equation, the denominator, approached zero, because you wouldn't think it's possible for this to approach zero. But in star-nosed moles, this does approach zero. So they eat things so quickly that what goes on is profitability starts to skyrocket for small things that they eat. So this was a big other clue to what the, was going on with these, this enigma of the star. And this made me look a lot closer at the star-nosed mole's eating habits. And one of the things I realized is that they have absolutely bizarre front teeth. So this is a normal mole here with its sort of normal teeth, and this is a star-nosed mole's front teeth. There's no other front teeth like this in the entire animal kingdom for mammals, and here's a closer view of them. And so if you were trying to figure out what does an animal eat, even from the fossil record, you would learn a lot from its teeth. And now I wanna go back and show you the star-nosed mole in action and what happens with these teeth, which are positioned right behind the 11th appendage. And so now, instead of thinking about what the star is doing, think about what the teeth are doing. These teeth form a little pair of tweezers that the mole uses to pluck up tiny little bits of food very quickly. And here you're gonna see a common mole tasked with the same challenge, just to show you that in fact, these specializations that the mole has, the star and its special teeth, really give it an ability that other moles simply don't have. So this other mole is completely incompetent at doing that. It really has no ability to eat these tiny little food items. So it turns out that these bits of evidence, all these different clues, including a number of clues that I haven't shown you, uh, show that the star-nosed mole's nose, this enigmatic structure, is a super touch sensor, and it seems to evolve for finding and eating small food fast. And another aspect of that that's, that, that's um, part of the mole's sort of evolutionary history is living in wetlands, in swampy areas, where there's lots of these little tiny things for the mole to find. So it all came together very nicely to sort of solve this mystery. Now at this point, I'm, I'm gonna show you something that might seem a little strange. I'm gonna show you this old ad for the Ginsu knife. This is the Ginsu kitchen knife. And I just couldn't help but think about this when I was studying Starnos moles because in this old commercial, they would tell you these 20 things that the knife could do. They, they'd try to sell you five, under, five other things. And then they'd say, but wait, there's more. And there's always more in science. And there's always more with the star-nosed mole, too. So I want to tell you another thing that the moles could do that is absolutely amazing. And that is that if you look at how they hunt underwater, because they are semi-aquatic and they can dive for food, and I wondered how might they possibly use the star while they're in water sort of foraging around for little invertebrates in this area. So I put them under the high-speed camera and what I saw was something that was really very strange and confusing. So essentially these guys are exhaling air bubbles as they search for things and then they're re-inhaling the same air bubbles. Now it took me a little while of watching this before I figured out what was going on. And it turns out that this is amazingly underwater sniffing. And one thing to know is that humans and small mammals sniff very differently. So we inhale multiple times when we are, are trying to smell where something is. Small mammals exhale and then re-inhale in a cycle that's called the sniff cycle. And this is exactly what star moles are doing underwater. And so 
Of course, I want to show you this because it's amazing to see. So this will be a Starnos mole searching for something. There's a little bit of food. And this is again in slow motion, but watch the air bubbles get sucked in and out as it's sniffing its way along underwater. Now this, they can actually follow a scent trail underwater. You're gonna see this closer up here. Now this was something that was thought very logically to be impossible for mammals to do in water. And yet here it is, a star-nosed mole using olfaction, using the sense of smell while underwater. And the trick is to use the air that you brought with you in your own lungs to basically exhale that, collect odorants and re-inhale it. Now, um, this was another one of those areas that, that, that was a clue to me about a bigger picture. And what I thought was, really, there's no real reason that you need to have a star to have this underwater sniffing trick. So I wondered if maybe other mammals might be able to do this. And I had the perfect example because we were catching accidentally water shrews along with star-nosed moles. You saw that picture early on of the water shrew with the fish. So I wanna tell you a little bit about this other amazing animal. It's the smallest mammal diver. It only weighs about 12 grams. It's incredibly fast and efficient. It can catch fish as part of its diet. It can also catch crayfish. And it is, if you look at this encounter, this might look really daunting for the water shrew and it is a little daunting. But the way this always ends is the crayfish is just too slow and the water shrew always manages to be victorious and, and defeat the crayfish and, and basically have it for lunch. And I wanted to tell you one reason that this tends to always happen. Well, one reason is the water shrew is warm blooded. So the, the crayfish is the temperature of the water. So it's got that disadvantage. But there's another fundamental advantage that all of us mammals have over invertebrates, and that is we have myelin that wraps around our nerve fibers, and this greatly speeds the conduction velocity of signals in our brain and coming to and from our spinal cord. And even though the crayfish has giant fibers like the squid, it's slower than our fibers, and so it's never going to be as fast as a water shrew. Okay, so that's a little bit of an aside. I know you're probably waiting to know, does a water shrew sniff underwater? So here's the video. I'm going to roll the tape. This is a water shrew exploring a piece of insect cuticle. And sure enough, there it is. These guys can also follow a scent trail underwater so they have underwater olfaction as well. And it's really kind of incredible that this was discovered in a, an animal with a totally bizarre nose, but it's not because of the bizarre nose that animals are capable, capable of doing this. And in fact, this has since been discovered in a Russian Desmond, the, another small semi-aquatic mammal. So probably lots of small mammals can do this. Okay, so... That I think is a really amazing finding. And I just wanted to highlight some of the things that were discovered in Starnos moles just by taking a closer look. I've got my metaphor here of sort of swinging your metaphorical telescope over and looking at this outlier that's got visible brain maps. It's got a touch fovea like our visual fovea. It's got ultra fast foraging that puts it in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's got underwater sniffing. And it's actually got a lot more. I just haven't had time to tell you everything that these animals can do. So I wanted to close out on Starnos moles there. And this is my reminder that I'm sort of turning the page to talk about another species. And this is going to be the electric eel. So I got interested in electric eels because I teach a class about animal behavior and their nervous systems. And I was always showing in my class this picture that I like of this guy, Christopher Coates, with this giant electric eel. It's a fun picture, but it's outdated. It's from the 50s. I love to do photography of different species. And I thought it would be fun to bring some to the university and get some 
good pictures and some good movies for my class. And so I did that. And here's one of those animals, absolutely beautiful animal. So this is an electric eel from the lab and essentially looking out of the aquarium. And I wanna tell you a little bit about these guys before I get into the research. So the amazing thing about these guys is that most of their body is made up of electric organ, of electric generating tissue. So that's why they have this eel-like form. And while I remember they live in fresh water in the Amazon, so they don't live in the ocean, and they are actually related to other freshwater electric fish. So that's um, a little bit about this species. They are, and, and their output of electricity is very interesting. So they give off pulses of electricity. And when they're giving off these pulses of electricity, they form a dipole electric field in the water around themselves. And so you can imagine though, if you're giving off 600 volts of electricity, probably people have known about this animal for a long time. And that's absolutely true. So there was an obsession with electric eels in the 17 and 1800s when people were trying to understand electricity. There were epic quests to get these animals. And one of the more famous quests is, was by Alexander von Humboldt, who went to experiment on electric eels in South America, among many other things. And he couldn't get anyone to get him electric eels until he came to a village of, that had fishermen in it who basically said, we're gonna fish with horses to get you some eels. And Humboldt watched this spectacle in amazement as the fishermen hoarded electric eels into the water. They, and, and after herding them into the water and keeping them there, the horses were shocked by the eels until the eels were exhausted and then the people collected them for Humboldt. Now I'm gonna come back to that story a little later because it's such a famous story and it's, it's got some interesting sort of connections to modern studies. Um, but I also wanted to tell you that electric eels have two power settings essentially. Every electric eel gives off high voltage and low voltage. So this is it kind of depends on each individual eel's physique. It's sort of like a weightlifter can lift a certain amount of weight. Well, each electric eel can give off a certain amount of high voltage and a certain amount of low voltage. And the low voltage is part of the sensory system that it uses. And the high voltage, as you can imagine, is its weapon that it uses against, for example, horses and people. And I'm now going to play you the sounds of an electric eel. So here, here will be a, an electric eel searching it's an aquarium. And the sounds you're gonna hear are because I've got electrodes in the aquarium, basically wires that are connected to a speaker. So you can listen in to the electricity in the water. So first you'll hear it's, it's, it's uh, searching low voltage pulse. And this is the high voltage. That was a fish that it went after. You may have seen that. So those are the two outputs that it's got. Okay, so how did this get interesting? So this got really interesting when I put them under the high voltage, I'm sorry, under the, the, the high speed camera to watch them in slow motion. And so you're gonna see uh, some examples of that. And what I've done for you is to colorize frames red during the time in slow motion when the eel is giving off the high voltage. And what I want you to notice is that as soon as the high voltage starts, the fish is completely frozen up and absolutely still. And you might think that this is because the fish is dead. Well, actually it's not dead. The fish is simply briefly immobilized and you'll be able to see that in this next example. So when the eel misses and slows down its pulse rate, the, the, the fish immediately reactivates. And so that was the first sort of question. What is going on here? How could all voluntary motion possibly be shut down in only three milliseconds? It only took three milliseconds for that to happen. And so what I imagine might be going on is what if this is like a law enforcement taser? What if this acts the same way as this piece of technology that, uh, is, is that we know a lot about. So um, I started doing some experiments and the question was how could you um, possibly measure what was going on with, with fish muscles? And the solution was to use a dead 
fish. So this is actually a, a dead fish with working muscles. And to separate the dead fish from the eel with an electrically permeable barrier and then feed the eel earthworms. And so what happened is the eel would shock the earthworms over here and I could record what was going on in the fish muscles at the time. And essentially what it turns out happens is there's this immediate massive tension in the fish muscles. And so in fact, it does look like the eel is acting like a taser, but a lot of other things were evident from the studies using this preparation. And one of them is that each, as the eel slows down, each electric high voltage pulse causes a twitch in the fish. And so I'm not gonna show you all of the different experiments, but I'm gonna summarize something amazing that is going on, which is when the eel sends a signal to a, a neuron that activates its electric organ, that signal goes out into the water and actually activates the neuron in a nearby fish that causes muscle contraction. So this is sort of the more elaborate diagram of what's going on to show something that I think is more easily shown in this cartoon, which is basically that literally electric eels have a means to remotely control the muscles in nearby animals. So it's a really remarkable view of what's going on with the electricity from an electric eel. And there are other things that the eel is able to do using high voltage once you start to think about it in this way then other things become evident. And so what I wanna now show you is an electric eel hunting and searching for, for things using blips of high voltage. So these are called doublets and you're gonna be able to hear one of these. So you're gonna hear the low voltage sensory output and then you'll hear a little click sound. That was a high voltage blip. And they're really interested in metal. And so the question is, why would they be doing that? What is that about? And essentially, here's what is a good candidate for that to be their strategy. Basically, if an electric eel were to come around a hidden prey item, and I want to just sort of mention, they hunt at night in the Amazon. So they're not usually eating goldfish. There's lots of hidden things in the Amazon. So they can give off these blips of high voltage. And if you are a nearby animal, you have no choice but to respond by having your muscles contract, which is essentially a way that you would advertise your presence. If you, so the same thing actually would happen to a person in water around an electric eel. If it gave off one of these high voltage blips of high voltage, your entire body would twitch. And that is essentially what you might call a dead giveaway for your position. And the reason that that would work and does work is because electric eels are super sensitive to water motion. So if you twitch, and this will be an example that's not a twitch of an animal, this is just a water droplet, and I wanna see show you how the eel reacts. So they shock first and ask questions later, essentially. So the electric eel is very much tuned in to these little tiny water movements, and in fact, it turns out they're doing this. So what the, the experiments show that if something is hidden from the eel, it'll give off these doublets, sort of trying to figure out what's going on. And if it gets in response to that, a water motion from a twitch, it'll then go and give the full high voltage volley and attack. And that's what you're seeing in red here. So essentially they have two modes of remote control. They can either freeze up prey like a taser or they can cause hidden prey to twitch and then freeze it up like a taser to eat it. Um, and that is pretty remarkable. And you know, as happens in these kinds of studies, other things sort of fell out of these experiments. And so now I wanna show you an eel just going straight after a fish and attacking it and eating it. And I'll tell you that what went on there is essentially the onset of the high voltage, a head movement, and then a suction feeding attack. And you can tell that it was a suction feeding attack because air comes out of the gills when the eels do this. Now, um, it turns out that when they attack a water motion, they don't bite. There is no suction feeding. And that was another clue that maybe something interesting is going on. And the question is, why would it be different when there's no prey there? And 
related to that, I want to tell you that prey are conductors. So essentially, they use their electric sense to search for conductors. And when there is no conductor there, they essentially don't bite at anything. And, and so um, to understand what's going on, I want to go a little deeper into the senses of electric fish. So in the 1950s, uh, a guy named Lisman discovered that electric fish are using this electric field surrounding them in order to probe their environments based on many different components, but essentially one of the main things that they're, they're essentially detecting is how conductive things in their surroundings are. And so a lot of these little weakly electric fish will detect conductors, non-conductors, based on how the electric field changes um, when these things enter their surroundings. And so the, it turns out the electric, the electric eel is doing exactly the same thing. And this has actually been known for a long time, but it's always been thought that it's been going on with the low voltage, not with the high voltage. And so how is this functioning? Well, I want to show you a little more of the beautiful anatomy of these animals. So this is one of the electric eels in the lab. And now I'm going to colorize for you and show you the different sensors that they have. So these green areas show you water motion sensors that allow them to home in on little twitches in the water. This red area that I've colorized for you are electroreceptors. And these are used to monitor the eel's own electric field in order to detect things. And they do this again by how the electric field changes based on nearby objects. And fish are conductors. And they can determine that the, the field lines have converged through the conductor. And this will activate the receptors here and tell them that there's a nearby fish and that is what they'll attack. Now, one of the things though is that um, this has always only been thought to be possible with the weak output, the, the low voltage part of the electric field. So the, the question of why during the high voltage output, these two things would be different suggested maybe the electric eels are using high voltage to track things during the strike. And so the test for this is to add a conductor to this side of the equation, so to speak, and see if putting an artificial conductor in there causes the eel to chase it and attack during only the high voltage. And so now I'm going to show you one of many experiments. And this, uh, this is a really phenomenal piece of behavior because what you're going to see here is a bunch of plastic discs and one conductive disc, and you'll see the electric eel's response during the high voltage. So that's the low voltage. But during the high voltage, it could track that thing. And now you're gonna see the same thing in slow motion. So here's the conductor coming around. And the question is, during the high voltage, can that eel follow the conductor and attack it as if it was a fish? And sure enough, it does. Perfectly timed, perfectly aimed strike at that small, very fast moving conductor. That is actually one of the very best examples of active electroreception using electricity in the entire animal kingdom being used by an electric eel in a way that was thought to be essentially impossible, that is using high voltage. Um, I, I, I can't you sort of overstate how amazing that is because this to me is almost like straight out of a science fiction movie. And so I had to, I had to find the right movie to give this comparison. This is like the electric eel can see you with electricity and shock you at the same time. It's almost as if the electric eel has laser vision. Um, and, and, and this is Lopan, the, one of the sinister characters in this movie, Big Trouble from Little China. So um, they are essentially doing things that are as, as amazing as some of our wildest dreams about what can go on um, in the realm of science fiction. But it's science fact that they can do this. Okay. So does anything compare to an electric eel? So one of the things that you know, we like to do is try to find generalities in how animals are using their sensory systems. And now I'm gonna tell you about a species that actually does something somewhat similar. It probes its environment with pulses of energy and it increases its pulse rate drastically when it's 
going in for the kill when it's attacking something. And it might surprise you to know that this similarity is in a bat. So echolocating bats, when they're hunting insects, give off these low rates of echolocation calls, but then they have something famously called the feeding buzz that comes at a very high rate, and it's a lot like an electric eel in terms of the output rate when it needs to illuminate its target at the greatest resolution. And I actually went to a park and filmed a bat, and I'm going to show you this. You'll see it first in, in, in you'll see it one time, and then you see it three times repeated. So I hope you could hear that buzzing sound. That was as this bat caught an insect and needed to use the highest rate and the highest resolution during the attack. And so there's an aspect of the eel's high voltage that is essentially completely analogous to that way of, of probing its world. Okay, so now um, I wanna sort of closing in on sort of um, the last things I wanna talk about is this, um, discovery that was purely by accident, which is an eel leaping out of the water at a conductor. So normally, this is a metal net, and I discovered this purely by accident. Normally, eels never come out of the water um, when they're swimming around, but if you approach them with a metal net, um, they actually do this, and that was very surprising to me, and it reminded me back to Humboldt's fish story about electric eels attacking horses. And I say fish story, which is in some way accurate because an electric eel is a fish. But what I really mean is his exaggerated story that a lot of people didn't believe. So this was published in 1807. And subsequently, quite a number of people thought that this was kind of crazy. In fact, Christopher Coates, the guy in that black and white picture, basically called it Tommy Rot. Sachs, who was an investigator who went back to South America, said this is impossible. It could have never been the custom for uh, people to have caught eels by driving horses into the water. Okay, so what to make of this? You know, um, this was something that um, when I saw the eels starting to jump up and attack things, I thought, wow, what if this would sort of might relate back to this, this unusual story by Humboldt? Well, um, as you investigate what goes on with electric eels a little further, Michael Faraday turns out to provide us with a really good clue about what's going on. He experimented with electric eels as well, as so many people did in the 1800s. And one of the things he pointed out is that when the eel is in the water, and you reach in and touch it, the shock is not very strong and it's only felt in the part that's immersed in water. And so what that means is if a predator was going after and sort of messing with an electric eel, so to speak, it, the, the electric eel might not be able to defend itself very well because that electrical current is mostly passing through the water and not affecting the predator. And so coming out of the water to attack something actually the, if you look at the um, electrical circuit that develops, it turns out this is exactly what you would want to do to increase the voltage experienced by your target. Okay, so this is a sort of dry circuit diagram, and I thought there's got to be a better way to show this to people than a circuit diagram. And so what I ended up doing was filling an, a, a fake plastic arm with light emitting diodes and uh, connecting it to the water um, with a, a grounding wire and presenting this to the eel for it to attack. So I'll let you use your imagination of what it would be like to have an electric eel come after you. So that is a really efficient deterrent, as I'm sure you can imagine. And those lights were all run by the electric eel. I also put them into a prop alligator head. enough, they use this to defend themselves very efficiently. And as I was considering what this meant about Humboldt's story, I found this amazing image, which basically I had to do a little sleuthing. This is now common on the internet, but it was very um, obscure at the time I was thinking about all this. And it turns out that this image is by a guy that was a friend of of Humboldt, this guy named Robert Schomburg, and it was published in the 1800s, and it's a depiction of what 
Humboldt described, and there's an electric eel coming out of the water to attack a horse. So I am, uh, what, what I am um, suggesting here is this is exactly what happened, and it makes perfect sense now that we know this. Now, um, 216 years after Humboldt told his story, I published this paper supporting his story, and absolutely amazingly, about a, a, a month after that, this video was posted to Live Leaks, and you're going to love this video because here's a fisherman in uh, South America trying to kill an electric eel, and I'll just let you watch what happens. <laughs> Se rodar ele, se ele vir a rede pega ele. Mata lá, mata. Okay, so that eel attacked him, and I'm going to show you the frame where the eel leaps up out of the water, presses its lower jaw against the guy, and paralyzes him with electricity, just like what I've been seeing in the lab, and just like what Humboldt suggested happened. So it's very obvious that this absolutely does go on in the Amazon. It's almost certainly what Humboldt observed. And I think that, you know, electric eels really deserve our admiration. They can do an incredible number of things. They have two modes of prey remote control, two modes of electroreception, high speed tracking with high voltage. I didn't even tell you about this part and they can leap out in self-defense. So with that, I'll tie things up. So thank you for listening. I wanted to thank uh, my publisher and Allison Collette, my editor at Princeton University Press, and our outreach person, Sarah Henning Stout. Also my wife, Liz Catania, who works with me at Vanderbilt in the lab, Glenn Northcutt and John Koss, who I worked with for many phases of the research and our funding from the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Guggenheim Foundation. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you for a fascinating and, and somewhat horrifying talk. <laughs> <laughs>